Okay, we're going to move into our final session now, and we have a traditional panel session. I have three panelists, so I will invite them to come up and take the hot seats while I go and um, compare questions. I think I'll try comparing questions from over here this time, just to make it clear that uh, these are the ones where you get to ask the questions, um, and I just have to allocate them out across the um, panel. So, our panellists that, that we have here, and I'll call them out as we come nearest to me onwards, we have um, Paul Wilson from Key Retirement Solutions, we have Kim Lurch-Thompson from Living Time, and Mike Morrison from... Are you still AXA or not? I know AXA's gone through these slight hiccups lately. So AXA, I, AXA Wealth. AXA Wealth, right, right. That's the independent bit of AXA that's still French. So, you've got, still got access to the lovely chateaus and the wine cellars of AXA and... Best bit of working for AXA, I would have thought. Yes, I've been very envious of anybody I know that AXA. They say, oh, we got this out on the staff discount, you know, and the rest of it. Um, anyway, so um, it's a panel session. I'll ask the three panellists just to kick off with sort of, you know, a brief intro on the subject matter which we're looking at, which is how is the post-retirement market evolving, sort of no more than a couple of minutes, perhaps, from each of you, and then we'll head out to the audience for questions. So if we go in... Order. I don't know whether, Paul, you'd like to go first. Uh, well, we're seeing a, a massive upturn now in a sort of rounded, holistic advice service around the equity release side of uh, post-retirement. Uh, we're seeing a massive uh, upsurge, especially this year, on uh, inquiry levels. It seems to be becoming more and more mainstream in the advice process. We're seeing a number of other firms... Um, referring into us as well. Uh, so we now think that equity release is uh, part of the retirement picture. Great. Thank you. Kim? Well, I, I, mean, I set up Living Time five years ago, five years ago this Monday, purely because I did see there was a space emerging. And it seemed to me strange that you had a sort of low risk, low reward products like lifetime annuities and potentially high risk, high reward drawdown and no middle market. And it seemed to me that there would a middle market had to develop, as it has in most markets, and now that's what we're finding. I think critical to get the thing going was the abolition of compulsory annuitisation, and not because I, I don't believe in lifetime annuities. In fact, I strongly believe in everything that Tom said, but not at the beginning of retirement for a lot of people where you want to keep sort of flexibility and control. So... I believe a lot of people have bought lifetime annuities from default or ignorance because they're not aware that they could do something else. So now that you can do something else, I think that will encourage advisors to have to offer more advice. So as far as I'm concerned, this is game on, and now it's up to providers to actually find solutions to actually grow that middle marketplace. Brilliant. Mike? I think to me the two big changes I've noticed over the late years, well, when I first started, the, the one sort of things that seemed set in the pensions world was the retirement age. You know, you know, men retired at 65, women retired at 60. There was no variable about it. That was it. And that's constantly changing now. The age is getting put back. And the other thing was that you know, there were a lot of DB schemes. The responsibility for pensions was taken by the employer. We've seen that transfer of responsibility to the individual. And the retirement age keeps moving out. So I think the more choice... Again, I'm a big fan of annuitisation. I like what Tom and the panelists were saying, at the right age. Choice of when you annuitise is good. But we've got to have flexibility in that gap so that people perhaps can choose to defer a bit. I almost see retirement perhaps a lot more as a linear process now where perhaps some people start off doing drawdown for a few years, get to a point where perhaps they've done all right but they, they can't afford to lose any more money. Perhaps they take a, a temporary annuity or a limited downside on the... Uh, um, very, you know, variable annuity type third way, and then ultimately buy a lifetime annuity. So really it's about providing the various sort of um, you know, tools in the kit bag for the clients and the, and the advisors. Thank you. Yeah, it's really going to be quite broad-ranging, this um, you know, post-retirement market, and we shall be watching with interest to see, see how it evolves. Now, some questions from the floor on the post-retirement market, and I have one in the middle table here. Please, Miranda. Thank you. Paul Morland representing Avello. Um, given the relatively low sales of index-linked annuities um, and the 
pretty unconcerned view that the market has of inflation on the one hand. And then quantitative easing, we're really in a new monetary environment. No one quite knows how that's going to work out. What will the implications for the industry be if we get about of six, seven years of 7% inflation and we then get a lot of media stories about uh, uh, pensioner poverty and what a shame I wasn't told about index linking? Right. Who wants to... Who wants to I'm very Tim. happy to kick off on this one. I mean, it's interesting because with national savings having brought out their index-linked bond, it is the only product in the UK that guarantees you you're going to have more money at the end of the term than you start off with. I think there's been a number of things. First of all, there's been supply and demand of index-linked assets. There hasn't been enough supply. There's been massive demand, so it's driven down returns on it. And then there's the fact, the point that was made earlier on in the day, the sort of jam today versus jam tomorrow. So people have chosen to have higher income now than later on. And it's an interesting point that, as most people haven't saved enough for retirement, a level annuity, in a very crude way, works quite well because you have the higher income in the earlier part of your retirement when you have higher income needs, and then it sort of declines later on. I think one of the interest points is that you know, they've always, lifetime annuities have always been sold as the no investment performance risk, but it carries massive inflation risk. Now, that didn't matter 100 years ago when people potentially only lived five or six years in retirement. But if you're going to potentially live 20, 30, 40 years, it's not if there's going to be a bout of inflation at some stage, it's when. And the thing is, if you're in a lifetime annuity, there's nothing you can do about it. While if you're in other forms of assets, you can switch into something which will give you some protection against inflation. And that's the, the big downside, as you say, five lots of 7 or 8% inflation, and you've lost you know, potentially nearly half your value of your pension. Mike, do you want to yeah, comment I, I, on I, that? It's... I think I would echo that. And going back to the, the whole of the last two days, this idea of um, you know, involving the customer, looking from the customer perspective... I think a lot more education as to well, one of the stats earlier on was, uh, uh, Stuart, was that 68% of people don't know what a percentage is. Uh, how many people don't know what inflation does and what the effect of compounding effect of inflation over a number of years is? You know, we think 4% is high, but go back. How many inflation cycles, like we had in the 70s, could we have in someone's retirement going forwards? So I think we've got to have a lot more education. The only, the only real solution you would have is some form of compulsion of having to buy some form of escalating income. But that takes away from, as Kim said, where people want income today, not income tomorrow. So I think we're back to this idea of really trying to get people to understand the effects of inflation at an early age or early stage. Um, Tom's point about you know, the lower end where 80% of income is based on um, with the, the triple lock-in on state benefits, perhaps that assists. But again, to me, and this whole retirement issue is about how you get people involved and understanding all the risks that they face, be it annuity risk, be it investment risk, or whatever. It's a really, really tough one, this, because they tend to only understand it after the inflation has arrived and after they've seen their pension reduced. I, I used to have to deal with the customer complaints in the late 80s, and we would typically have a sort of old-age pensioner write in saying, I've been a pensioner of yours for 20 years, and for the last 20 years you have put the pension up by absolutely nothing, and inevitably she would write in just after we've made some super stock market announcement about our with-profit bonus rates higher than ever before, or our dividend up for shareholders, and she'd say, you're giving it to the shareholders, not a penny to me. And I'd have to write back and explain she'd bought a level annuity. <sighs> yes. Right. Um, next one. Next one. Over up on this side, please. I found it interesting that there's nine annuities sold last year in Australia. That's actually a growth because in 1984 there were two sold. And, and those were two sold to two chief executives of life offices, so that either means there's more life office chief executives or there's something strange developing over there. But why is it just nine? I've actually got just... Uh, when I left my house today, I had about nine Australians in there, which was good talking about cricket, but the nine Australians were, um, are all self-funding retirees. They're proud to say that they don't rely upon the Australian age pension because they don't get one. And... This is something that's been embedded into the Australian system for years where we don't have financial advisors in Australia. They are planners. They plan 
because they've got a plan to ensure that they, they work at how to get maximize their benefits and uh, because of the Australian means tested system and they're very geared and focused on this. Um, I came away last week, last week, I went to Australia House to hear about their migration policy which is set about bringing the right people in to fill the right jobs to create the right employment, the economic growth in the country. And I'm doing the same in New Zealand House next week. But the, the UK system works on a system where, uh, which is EET, the funding is, uh, is essentially exempt from tax, the growth of the fund is exempt from tax, but it's taxed on retirement. Australia works uh, the other way around, it's taxed on, on contribution, taxed on growth and exemplary retirement. Is the system in the UK fundamentally wrong in that perhaps we have to change it round to change the tax system round so we get the taxes up front and it's exempt at the end? Have we got the system, does it need to be corrected? Do we have to change the whole system completely? Tim, would you change us from EET to well, something different? Be, before I set up Living Time, I actually did some research out in Australia uh, to see some of the companies out there. And there, in fact, they did have fixed term annuities. And then sort of people started thinking about sort of uh, uh, doing that until you reach a certain a number of years left before you were going to die. I think it all depends on where you start from. And all these things are both the US, Australia, everywhere. It's around the tax incentives that are built up. So we are where we are. Uh, you know, would lifetime annuities exist in the UK? It's sort of what's behind your question, isn't it? If they'd never been invented. But I think, again, if you go back 100 years ago, most people were in things called final salary schemes. You were in one employer for most of your life. That was the standard rate. So the lifetime annuity was the promise you had from your employer prior to retirement, put into payment after retirement. But you know, things have changed very, very rapidly. You know, it's the last 20 years seen huge change. You know, everyone moving around jobs, final salary schemes are virtually disappearing now, and therefore you could argue that the lifetime annuity maybe is a 20th century product. But to me, you've got to think, and Tom raised this, it's about the insurance element. You know, that's what insurance should be about. When you buy term insurance, you pay a small premium for a big benefit. When you buy a lifetime annuity when you're young and healthy, and a lot more healthy than you were, you pay a big premium for a small benefit, and you lose all that control and flexibility. So if people get back to the basics of what a lifetime annuity is meant to do, it's meant to protect you against living too long. So bought at the right age, it's a fantastic solution, because it, it, it is what it says. It's an insurance product. But when you buy it too young, for example, the chance of dying at roughly about 80 is about the same chance as zero coming up on a roulette wheel, so about one in 37. Now, you wouldn't go to Ascot and bet on many horses at 37 to 1 and expect to win on it. So, you know, if it's treated as an insurance product and it does what it says, absolutely fantastic. As an investment product when you're young, it's not so good. Paul, can, can I ask you about equity release and the concept of the sort of voluntary annuitization process? And if I understand it, if I've got a house and I'm a pensionable age and I want to do equity release, I could just dip in and take some chunks out from time to time, or I could tip in and take a big chunk and buy an annuity with it and, and buy a sort of guaranteed income for the rest of my life. With Which way do people go and, and, and why do they go one way or the other? Um, generally, the, the most popular products with an equity release at the moment are drawdown products. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and the, the part of the property that they don't draw down is protected. There's now new products so that the loan just won't keep eating away at the property yeah. value. Uh, we're seeing sort of 75% of the marketplace is drawdown on equity release. So they're using it as sort of lump sum incomes. They'll take out sort of 10,000 pound pots yeah. um, each sort of uh, various years. So rather than taking it out and putting it in an annuity, um, because unfortunately they see this large amount of money and think, so I'm going to put that in an annuity and get this small income. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't do that if I'm, unless I have to. So you have that in the annuity world where you, it's compulsory to do it, yeah. um, certainly for the, the vast majority of the sum, whereas with the equity release, they'll take the small lumps out. Right. Um, as opposed to the, the large lump sum. So the three to one ratio of preference. Yeah, yeah. lovely. Okay, thank you. Right, um, who, would, who would like to give us the next question then? So, 
And we have one right, right at the back in the green shirt, if you please. Paul, I was intrigued by your comment that the equity release market, sorry, John Lawson, Standard Life here, mm -hmm. uh, that the equity release market uh, was in rude health. Um, you know, up until a couple of years ago, th th this market was in terminal decline. What, what's caused its, its revival? Is it the economy? Is it, you know, the, the pensioners' needs for, for capital uh, that, that have suddenly risen? Or is it the new products is that, 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 that's caused this? You know, what's the reason behind the, the resurgence? Um, I would say we, the main surge that we saw in the equity release market was around about five or six years ago, and it plateaued out and went down slightly, but has actually come back in the last two years. Primarily, I think um, people aren't being sold interest-only mortgages term into retirement. Uh, they're finding it more and more difficult to find those sort of products, so equity release is now becoming more of a mainstream choice. Um, I also think a lot of the stigma has been uh, removed from equity release. Um, we haven't seen uh, the proposed mis-selling scandal that uh, everybody um, uh, proposed was going to happen in the equity release market. I think the people that are out there selling equity release do it in a very uh, robust fashion. Uh, and uh, the regulator has been working very closely with all the firms that are involved and have their own um, uh, action committee, as it were, to keep looking at equity release and how it is sold to make sure that it, the client's benefits and health are taken into consideration. We've seen uh, this new products that have come out that are enhanced equity release products. Um, I think we're going to see more innovation in the market uh, moving forward. But I think, by and large, uh, the public are becoming more and more comfortable with equity release as, a, as a, an alternative. Um, a lot of people coming up to retirement, the average, person who the average age of a person taking out an equity release plan is around about 68 years of age. Um, we're seeing that a lot of people haven't saved into a pension, uh, and so this is becoming an alternative to having income in retirement. Before we go to the next question, I want to ask one, because occasionally as chairman you're allowed to ask a question. I want to ask you about expenses and what sort of levels of expenses do you think it would be acceptable to build into these post-retirement products? Because we can expect with the new freedoms we've got that we will see more guarantees being added, more flexibilities being added. And, and I'm mindful of the fact that the, uh, the Telegraph did an expose, which I guess was probably about two years ago now, where they, they looked at the American variable annuities that were, were being sold, and some of them were selling successfully over here, and they were um, exposing expense levels equivalent to a sort of reduction in yield of 3%, 4%. What sort of level could we feel comfortable with in the current interest rate environment, and what sort of flexibility and guarantees do you think we can, customers can buy for the levels of expenses we might feel comfortable with? So, Kim? Right. Um, well, I mean, lifetime annuities are very cheap in the sense of the ex ongoing expenses, very large number of people, so that's yes. quite cheap. I think you, when it comes on to variable annuities, I mean, well, let's take another example. If you, if you take value protection on a lifetime annuity, that's very good value as well because uh, the chance of dying quite small early on gradually increases as the benefit goes down. Yes. So I, I think it's going to be value versus perceived cost of 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 it. So some of the early variable annuities, undoubtedly when you had charges of say 2 or 3%, then you had fund management charges and everything else. If you have a low inflation environment and um, with you know, sort of very mixed investment performance, you can eat away a third to half of your fund over 20, 25 years. So I think going forward, there's got to be a lot more transparency over what those products actually have in them what the true benefits are, because I've seen some versions where you had guarantees that mysteriously vanished if certain adverse circumstances occurred, and that was just the reason why you took it out in the first place. Yeah. So I, I think there has got to be a value proposition, and I think, therefore, you can't isolate yourself against every risk. You're going to have to say, you know, what are the risks, uh, and do a percentage. So some of the more... 
uh, uh, recent variables will, uh, for example, only secure, say, 80% of the capital rather than 100%. But as long as you're transparent to the customer what they're getting and you try and find something where there's value, because you, you essentially want to offer a guarantee that's out of the money, so it's like an insurance premium. But if it's trying to cover you for everything, the cost is prohibitive. Mike, have you on, on costs and what's, what's acceptable? I'm not really a, a numbers or cost man, but I come back, I think, to the point that Kim made. I think it's value. And the key thing yeah. for me in some of these products really is trying to get people to understand exactly what they're getting. And if they're for in, in positioned in a market and the features of such a product appear to offer value to an individual and it can be shown that what, what is being compared from one to another is reasonable value, then perhaps these, uh, these, these third-way type products will, the market will improve. But to me, it's the complexity on charge and why we should use them that needs to be got through first. Yeah. And yeah, the argument, you know, we, insure our, we insure our houses, we insure our lives, is it important that we think about perhaps insuring our pension funds? But what is the reasonable insurance premium to, to insure our funds? Yeah. It is the holy grail. You know, trying to find something that would provide some sort of equity upside that is a greater value than the cost of providing it. Yes. <laughs> when, when we learn how to make gold, then we can all, all become alchemists. Yeah, that's right. Exactly so. so. Um, yeah, yeah. Paul, do you get value questions in, in the equity release market? Do you get a lot of pressure of people saying, you know, why do I have to pay higher rates of interest on an equity release mortgage than on a standard mortgage? I, I, I think that's one of the... Um, most difficult concepts that you've got to tell the client is that the interest rates are very different, based on very different numbers than the, uh, the standard mortgage market. You mean higher numbers, not different numbers. <laughs> higher numbers, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you're borrowing money over a very long period of time without any servicing of mm. uh, the loan. And yeah. That has to be factored into the... Uh, it's generally the no negative equity guarantee that costs uh, a substantial amount of money within the interest rate. Yeah. You know, it's, it's upwards of 1% of the actual interest rate itself. Um, you know, your, your base cost, the actual distribution costs within the interest rate are particularly high as well because you have a, a market that is still, you know, even with um, uh, good numbers this year, will probably be 1.5 billion. And in the, in the scheme of things, to advertise in that market, to actually get people in, interested is very expensive. Yeah. Uh, cost per inquiry ratios are, are very high and that's in your interest rate if, as a product provider. Thank you, thank you. Right, okay then, back, back to the floor. Who would, like to, who would like to take us for the next question? I've got three of the leading experts that you could possibly find in the industry here. It's, um, but if you haven't got one, I've got... Yes, yes, please, thank you. On the, on the front table. Hi, I'm Simon Hacker from uh, Axco Information Services. A um, couple of the questions up on the board I was interested waiting for you to comment on really were uh, to do with the combination of Solvency 2 and the gender equality decisions. Um, obviously going to have a material impact on annuity um, mm. prices for <coughs> males. Um, and when you had been talking about the desire for or the need for um, annuitization, um, uh, prices have just dropped or the benefits have just dropped probably by 20% in a year or so's time after the gender equality comes in, after Solvency 2 kicks in. Um, any comments on how that might affect the desirability um, of people annuitising now and in the future? Right, who'd like to go? Kim? I'm always happy, I don't want to hog, hog it, but um, I mean, Solvency 2 I mean, is, has been a bit of a nightmare. Uh, because it's been a, you know, sort of a, you know, so people think it's, it's solved, but it isn't. It's still ongoing work. I mean, it, it reminds me of the year 2K uh, in a sort of uh, issue that vast numbers of people making vast sums of money, uh, the amount that you, you hear that's being spent by some large companies on it, uh, are just going round and round, and still it's not totally nailed down yet. Uh, what we do know is it's likely to become more expensive, but how much more expensive? We don't know. I mean, certainly, from my perspective, selling you know short-term fixed-term annuities, the big thing for us is the credit risk cost. And clearly, if you're buying longer-term assets, 20 years rather than five years, 
you know, this is 148T or whatever, it's sort of formula thing you've got to feed in, it could make a difference of 5 or 10%. But one of the interesting points is if the market moves to the fact that people realise that maybe in the early years of retirement it may not be sensible as an insurance product to buy a lifetime annuity and you go to revolving five years until you reach an age where you know, the mortality cross subsidy or, or whatever other reason makes it sensible, you can actually get rid of most of that. So because there's no longer the need to annuitize at 75, you could keep going you know, for quite a long time through your retirement and get rid of a lot of that solvency to cost. As for the equalisation, I mean, we've already had it for protected rights to a certain extent already. It will make a difference, not a huge amount of difference, because a lot of uh, benefits are sold with joint life. So you've already got sort of a blended male and female, so probably a, a couple of percent. If age is abolished, then basically then you've got in perpetuity, and you, you just have to assume people live forever, um, <laughs> which is not particularly helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the interesting thing is, is for some of the uh, life companies, is when the marketplace begins to understand just how much more capital that they're going to need, and it it, it impacts on with profit as well and and other products. Um, so that may, unfortunately, one of the unintended consequences may be to drive people into into removing uh, you know the, the benefits of lifetime annuities because it just becomes too expensive. Thank you. Right. I look out. I look out across the floor again. Who would like to go towards the back, please, Miranda? Let's. Let's. Hi, yes. Uh, John Higgins from Barry and Hibbert. Uh, over the last couple of days, we've heard a lot about cons uh, communicating with customers uh, and also communicating risk. Uh, we've also seen the FSA guidance paper about uh, attitude to risk questionnaires and investment suitability. So I wonder whether or not, you know, it, it's difficult enough in the accumulation stage to, to communicate risk and making sure the customer actually understands it. Uh, in the decumulation where, where they're taking income, I'm wondering whether or not, do you think we're very good actually at, at communicating risks to, to clients and do they understand it? I'm going to ask all three of you in turn on that one because all three of you have got products that do involve risk to a greater or lesser extent with, with customers and that's what we go from the far end. Um, Mike, I risks you pose to customers, what are they and do they understand them? I don't think they understand a lot of them. I was doing some work the other day just breaking from the, the risk headings that you see. These are the risks faced in retirement, be it inflation, risk investment, risk, etc., etc. And sort of breaking them down into categories. And I came up with a list of around 20 different individual risks and yet we sort of um, lump them all together and I think you know the danger is I think as some of the behavioral economics uh, stuff shows people you know sort of value uh, or, or don't like a loss twice as much as a uh, gain and all of this stuff and trying to really get that down into sensible language that interrelates to to reality is a difficult thing now whether or not stochastic modeling tools questionnaires uh, and probably a combination of all of them, but as much for me, it's about plain language, I guess. You know, this idea, you know, we've already moved from um, you know, capacity for risk or capacity for loss, which is a start, so perhaps we need to be looking in a little bit more detail at some of those risks and, and, uh, and trying to translate them a little bit more into English, into a language that consumers understand. I've had a, lo a lot of IFAs recently come to me and say, Mike, we've picked up some new drawdown cases, um, Guy's on maximum GAD, but says he's totally risk averse. You know, how do I square the circle? And uh, you know, when you go through the risk profiles, and everyone comes out at a number five. And if you go back to the FSA profiling paper, number five could be this particular situation, or it could be this particular situation. Should they have the right sort of uh, portfolio? So I think there's a, this is a big story. I think you know, there's, there's a whole lot more to roll on on trying to define risk yeah. and make it understandable. Kim, how do you, how do you tackle yeah, that Yeah, well, I think it, it's probably helpful to look at the type of customer you've got first because they have different risk profiles. So tr trying to keep it simple, uh, two main types of customer. There's those basically where the funds at retirement is about wealth preservation, inheritance tax planning, how to maximise what they can pass on to you know, intergenerations. 
and then there's the vast majority where it's that they haven't saved enough, and it's how do you make the income spread over the rest of your life. So if you start from those profiles, that helps you to explain the risk. So you, know, you can then use that, that as a model. So uh, if you take the big mass, those who you've got to make the income last over the whole lifetime, then that means if you haven't saved enough, you want to try and get some element of growth. So you've got to explain what that means in the early years of retirement. You want the insurance benefit that kicks in at the end of retirement. And then you've got the, the uh, a, a challenge of explaining inflation risk, which is probably the biggest risk. What is the real value of your pension in retirement? And how do you have a strategy to change uh, during retirement if you have high inflation risk during that period? So I think if you look at the two customer profiles, that helps because then you can then look at the specific risks for each of those groups and then have ways to mitigate it. Thanks. And, and Paul, risk, risk in your market in particular, well explained to customers? Um, it's the big, most important part of the advice process. In the equity release world, you cannot um, um, do execution only business. It all has to be advised. Um, majority of the business done in the equity release world is done on a face to face yeah. advice. Uh, we're very keen to involve the family and on the guides that we produce with a number of uh, newspapers and a number of charities. Um, we have a whole section in there of involving the family um, because you know they're the ones that will probably see the risks more to their inheritance uh, than the actual people carrying out the, the equity release transaction themselves. Um, so as I say, it's, you know, we, one of the things that the regulator said about the equity release market was that the guides that are produced are very um, two-sided, that they very much support the pros and the cons of doing equity release. I'm going to ask the last one myself then in that case, because I want to ask you about the elephant in the room. We all know it's in the room. Andrew Dillnot knows it's in the room because he's looking at it. We're all very reluctant to talk about it. I am thinking, of course, long-term care. One in six of us will end up in a nursing home. Nursing home fees start at £500 a week, but if you watch the BBC Watchdog programme, you don't want to be in a home where they charge only £500 a week. Go for one of the ones, £750 to £1,000 a week, you get treated a bit better. How, with all our products set and our expertise in the post-retirement market, how can we help people prepare for long-term care fees? Can I take a comment quickly from each of you again, starting from the end? Long-term care, Mike? I wonder whether the scope for, you know, we've got used to this idea this year of a £50,000 annual allowance for pensions. Um, would it not make sense to have a, a supplement to that, perhaps an extra 5000 or £10,000 a year, solely which was devoted to, to long-term care issues. So you've still got some tax relief on a relatively small amount, but that could be, you only got that if that percentage of your annual allowance was used for some f funding of long-term care. I'm not sure how yet, but just to you know, build it on, almost on a, you know, blocks. I mean, it's a big subject. I mean, there's, you know, people don't like uh, uh, buying life cover because it means you may die. They don't, they don't write a will, and 50% haven't got a will because, again, that means you're going to die. They haven't saved enough for retirement, so, you know, care is right down the far end. But the annoying thing is, if you actually had that built in at point of retirement and maybe use part of the tax-free cash, because it's sort of a, a double decrement, you have to both live and need care, and a lot of people die in their own home, and most people don't stay in a care home for very long, the actual insurance cost of it, if done at point of retirement, is actually pretty reasonable. So maybe the government have to give some tax breaks to help with that. Uh, so you can actually pay for it. But at the moment, you can't do it. I mean, that's the thing. It's just a structural thing. You can't do it. And Paul, can your industry help with long-term care? Um, we've been very much looking at domiciliary long-term care as opposed to residential long-term care, um, that you can use the equity in the house to actually fund that care. And we've been working with one company in particular to actually try and design a product that is specifically around the equity and the long-term care piece. And we've been speaking with the, uh, the FSA uh, to make sure that they're in a comfortable place with how that product would be designed because obviously you've got an interest rate on the equity release. Is it guaranteed that it will last, uh, the funding would last as long as the, as the person would live? Because it's very, what you don't want is somebody has care and then it stops at some point because they've run out of equity in the home. So it's, it's a very difficult piece to know how to, 
to, to come up with a solution, but our view is, is that people will want to more and more have care in their own home rather than go into residential, especially with programs like Panorama. <laughs> they can't sell it to buy it, so they need one of your... Actually, I, I buy that. I buy that. I think people do like to be in their home. Yeah. So, well, thank you very much. Well, um, Mike, Kim, and Paul, thank you very much for coming in and sharing your expertise with us. Well, folks, we've been here. We've been here for two days. I've certainly enjoyed the two days. It's the moment to wrap up. Um, it's the fourteenth. Um, of these annual conferences on the future of the life and pensions market. I've been to a number. I've been to all 14 by any means. I've been to a number. I know a number of you have been to a number because I've met a number of you at successive ones. What has struck me, I think, on this one is that the atmosphere has been far more positive than I have seen for a long, long time at these events. And I kind of put that down to two reasons. I think one is that we are coming out of recession as the economists would tell us, the de-stocking is over. Um, de-stocking happens both in industrial materials and in labor as well, as um, some of us know we've had to slim our companies down a bit and say goodbye to a few friends along the way. But that period is over. Um, um, as one of our speakers told us, this month we have 88,000 more people in work in the UK than we did last month. Another told us business levels are back to the 2008 level, so the good times seem to be coming back through a bit. Um, I think the second reason why we are all much more positive than we were in previous ones is that the legislative changes that are taking place are now being implemented and being implemented faster than we have probably ever seen before. We're almost there with RDR that we've heard from several speakers. We heard one this morning. That is, we are now at the point where we can say what the right outcome is for the customer. We don't necessarily agree with it. We might not be happy with it, but we can see it and we can make sure it happens. Um, we had Nest yesterday, Laurie Edmonds. It is almost up and running for Nest. The automatic enrollment starts next year. The Nest scheme itself is doing a soft launch this year. Um, their first scheme, a golf club, apparently. But there you go, the things you learn at a conference. Um, retirement income changes, we've heard lots of that this afternoon. It's happening. The law changed on 6th of April. Compulsory annuitization was abolished. Could go down as a big moment in history. Your kids might ask you, where were you on 6th of April 2011 when compulsory annuitization was abolished? I don't, know, I don't think I know the answer to that one either, but um, there you go. I think it was a big and seismic moment, and I think only when the products unfold and we actually see something new and innovative and exciting coming through to the market and we realise, gosh, we couldn't have done that last year because it would have breached these revenue rules. And only then will we realise just how important um, a seismic event it was. Um, I think I just want to finish by just putting up a couple of quotes from one of our speakers this morning, Richard Roney. Richard Roney told us, the opportunity is there, the opportunity has increased, and I would ask you to go forth and seize that opportunity and make the best of it for all of us that work in the life and pension market. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you will enjoy, join me in one final thing, which is that we should pay thanks to our organizers' market force, without whom we wouldn't have had a conference. The organization over the two days has been seamless. The technology's been here. It hasn't fallen over. The speakers have all turned up. When they didn't turn up, a deputy turned up, and it was seamless. Again, the catering has been perfect. Everything has gone swimmingly well. That doesn't happen by accident, let me tell you. That happens because of the skill, and in particular because of the hard work and dedication of the conference organizers. Please join me in thanking Market Force, our organizer. Thank you.